welcome to Talks at Google. Today, we are celebrating Women's History Month with Lindsay Gardner and Bay Area chef Knight Yun to have a virtual talk about um, and food demonstration on uh, Lindsay's newest book, Why We Cook Women on Food, Identity and Connection. Um, Lindsay is an illustrator and mother of two daughters and um, she has worked on cookbooks, editorial projects, um, advertising campaigns, stationery, and interior design um, with an amazing artistic eye. And she has this new book called um, Why We Cook. And we also have Knight joining us, who is interviewed in the book. And she is the founder and chef of the street food inspired restaurant Numbai in Oakland, California. Uh, she's going to be sharing with us one of her favorite, um, I guess you could say condiments, and showing us how to make that and um, talk about women, um, food, and our inspirations. So please, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lindsay and Knight. Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi Knight. Looks like you're in a commercial Hi. kitchen there. <laughs> Yeah, very, very exciting. So uh, first, I want to say, Lindsay, this book is just beautiful. Um, and I don't know if it's because of it's the watercolors or because I need soothing in this uh, <laughs> this time. But the the book kind of centered me. Um, the 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 art, art was just so soothing for me. And um, I just wanted to put that out there first. And thank, and you. thank you for such a beautiful inspiration. Um, so first, this is, do you consider this an art book? Or do you consider this a conversation? Or is this a cookbook? Um. That's a great question. I think it's a little bit of all of those things. Uh, I like to think about the book as an, uh, an ongoing conversation. Um, and when I look back at the process of making it and how it came together and then what's happening now with continuing to have conversations with uh, a lot of the contributors in the book, it really is a conversation. And I, uh, I also think about how I made art in sort of in conversation with the contributors. Um, and so I think conversation is a really accurate word. I don't know that that's something that people normally apply to a book, but I like using that in relationship to why we cook. Okay. And and Knight, how was the conversation with Lindsay? Because Lindsay, you're not a, a professional cook, right? Correct. And yet you're, you're interviewing all these women in food. So how was that conversation with night did it that perspective change or um, help in in uh, bringing to light what you do i'll um let me take a first stab at that okay. question i think um i think it was a really interesting process for me being uh i sort of an outsider to this uh world of women working in the culinary industry and um the research process sort of unfolded in a really organic way. And it was great at the time I was living in the Bay Area. And so I was lucky enough to attend a few events. Um, one was at La Cocina, which of course Knight has a very close relationship with in San Francisco. And then um, another was at CIA Copia in Napa. And at both of those events, I heard um, a number of women speak and a few of them ended up being in the book later. So there was that part of my research. And then there was also just the wonderful unfolding of sort of organic conversation and how welcoming and generous every single person that I talked to was with their time and conversation in terms of um, introducing me to someone else who they thought might be interested in talking. Uh, and then it was also a, just to be totally honest, it was like straight up cold calling and emailing people. So it, the research really was a combination of all those things. Um, and I actually think that uh, that when I reached out to Knight, I just emailed her and asked her if she wanted to be part of it. So you're part of the cold calling process. <laughs> <laughs> <I was. laughs> 
<laughs> well, then, um, Knight, could she uh, share a little bit of your perspective of speaking with Lindsay? Did she have this great perspective in, um, or when something that came up was the questions, right? Lindsay, you wrote in the very in the foreword about how all of these came from your questions about cooking and food and why we cook in women and our relationships with food. Um, Knight, did you ever, you know, when Lindsay asked you all these questions, did it uh, spark more questions for you? Um, it really did because there's such a big, you know, woman, um, the woman community in cooking, it's so vast. And so for her to you know, ask me those questions, it kind of brought the community together even more and um you know also to reflect back in my experience as i started to cook too um you know i was a home cook as well and so i had all these questions as well when i was just learning how to cook and you know relating that to Lindsay, just you know writing a cookbook being a home cook um it all connected and um you know i now feel like i know uh, most of the chefs even more now through her cookbook um Lindsay, you, you quoted a poet, by saying, um, and it was a lovely quote, try to love the questions and live the questions now. How, now that you've written this, this book and, and interviewed so many people, how does that, do you have even more questions or do you feel that you have some questions that have been answered? Um, I think that one of the best parts about making this book is how my questions have deepened over the last three years. Um, I definitely started out with a number of questions, obviously, that inspired me to work on this project in the first place. But I think, uh, and I talk about this in the in the book, in the introduction, that one of the, the reasons that I am constantly drawn back to cooking as a place of inspiration and food as a place of inspiration is because there is, there's so much to learn. Um, and there's so much that connects us in asking those questions uh, that, I feel like in the best way, I have more questions now than I did even, you know, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. And that's why it's so exciting. And that's why I keep coming back. I mean, there are 112 women in the book, as well as um, the voices of home cooks. And I feel like it's just the tip of the iceberg, to be honest. And that's such an exciting and um, engaging feeling to to leave the research process with and also i really hope that when readers come away from experiencing the book they feel the same way that they're inspired to ask questions of themselves in a new way or go try something that they hadn't tried before or talk to their neighbor about their favorite food tra traditions um i hope that that inspires readers to uh, to engage that way with questions that they have. You are, um, the fact that you went off and cold called and, and met people that way. Night uh, as a chef, like I have questions while I'm eating the food and enjoying it. Uh, is there a good way as a person who's probably in the kitchen cooking um, to get to ask those questions um, from as a customer? Do we email you? Do we ask the waiter? Uh, what's a good way for us to engage with the chef in the moment, or is it better afterwards? Um, I get a lot of questions through my Instagram and also through um, emails because there's a lot of curious home cooks that are learning how to cook Cambodian food, either second generation Cambodian Americans that are so interested in reconnecting with their um, just wanting to connect with um, their culture, or learn more about Cambodian food. and they started a Facebook group where, you know, they've messaged me through Facebook about certain dishes or made requests if I could put it on the menu. So I'm pretty active and involved with the, you know, Cambodian community of, um, you know, guiding or teaching them certain dishes. You know, I, I would love it if you could try to describe what Cambodian food is, because um, when I was telling somebody about this talk, uh, I was raving about Cambodian food and they're like, what is Cambodian food? I was like, oh my gosh, how do, you know, it's a little Thai, it's a little Chinese. I mean, it's it really is unique unto itself. It is really, and um, I feel like Cambodian food, um, 
I mean, looking back, reading back about history, you know, it dates back to influence from India. And then we were colonized by France. So there's a little bit of French influence as well in our cooking. Um, the heart of Cambodian cuisine really is, um, which I'm going to demo today and also in the cookbook, is um, called Krum. Krum is the heart of Cambodian cooking, I mean, Cambodian recipes. And it's a herb and spice paste that we blend with the hulk. Um, it's a fermented fish paste. So you have, you know, the funky fish and the aromatic spice blended together. And to me, essentially, that's Cambodian food. It's light, refreshing, it's rustic. And it all depends from region to region as well. Like the food that I grew up eating was in, from the countryside because both my parents were from Batabong and it's the countryside. So we used a lot of fish, um, kriung in our cooking. Um, a lot of fresh, um, um, there's also a lot of fish in the region as well. We do a lot of um, preserved fish, um, ceviche style salad, um, you name it. It's just one of the best cuisine really. Um, I crave it every day and it's food I cook every day. So. <laughs> so you bring up a really good point in that it's regional because in the, uh, the book, Lindsay relays the fact that you left Stockton, went to San Francisco to, to study and then couldn't find Cambodian food that you liked that was to you authentic. Um, can you speak, is that, was that your inspiration? Um, I know that you started cooking that way. Um, it was, I mean, it was selfish reason. <laughs> I moved out and I craved Cambodian food so much. And uh, I was living in San Francisco during that time. And then um, to my surprise, there was only one Cambodian restaurant, but it was, fusion with Thai food and so um, you know I seeked out to learn how to cook Cambodian food on my own and you know long story short um, I traveled to Cambodia to learn more about the cuisine and also my family's history and um, never intended to open a restaurant or never intended to be a chef but um, and here I am you know. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Lindsay, did you find that story kind of throughout the um, the people that you interviewed? Because, it um, you know, it's interesting. People come. I mean, obviously, I can't speak for anyone else than myself, obviously. But um, the stories in the book really, uh, to me, thread together in so many ways. There are are so many themes that come up that do tie them together, and. Um, yes, I would say that there are many stories where people came to food or cooking uh, in a way that surprised them or they weren't expecting to have it, um, you know, be such a big part of their life in, in the way that it is. Uh, but I also think that that's one of the things that's so special about reading and um, discovering the women that are working in this field is that the stories are so powerful. and. Um, and there's just so much there that adds meaning and layers of meaning to um, why people are doing what they're doing. Um, you have uh, women from all over, not just chefs, but activists, farmers, um, a bookstore owner, right? Uh, what was, did you think that there was, or did you feel going in that there would be an uh, overlaying theme to why they're all drawn to food? Because that seemed kind of like your, uh, your what you felt was that food was this tying, um, knitting sort of aspect of our lives as women um, and generational, you know, going through and sharing. Um, you know, I think when I was, when I started out, I was, um, the questions for me really started in my own kitchen and I've always loved to cook, but I started asking more questions about why cooking was so important to me um, as I became a mom and I was in the kitchen more and more. And I was sort of thinking about what am I giving my children and how am I passing on tradition to them? why do I care so much about what I'm doing and, and how I'm doing it? And then I took those questions into my studio and started working on them in my art as well. And I think that, I don't think I had um, necessarily like a 
theory of how everyone came to the to, to cooking with the same um, inspiration necessarily, but I did feel like there has to be something here that connects us all. And I think that now looking looking back at it, I think that um, I wanted to feel connected to women doing the same thing um, in all these different ways, right? And so I think that a, a big part of my questions came from that desire to sort of be like, well, what do other women think about this? And what brought a food writer to this path and what brought a chef to this path and what brought another home cook to this path. Um, and I just wanted to get as many different perspectives from as inclusive um, a group of women as I could to sort of bring their their thoughts and stories to that question. Yeah, and, and you did a, a great job of doing that. It was, um, there's so there's so many different stories, ones that are really inspirational, some that are just so, so powerful. They actually brought tears to my eyes. Um, Me too. And you, you have um, this art that ties it all together. I was just wondering about your art process because I, I recall you saying that normally art is, is put in after all of the text is in and you actually kind of reversed it, right? We had a really, it was a really interesting um, process making the book because I was involved in writing the manuscript, doing all the research and gathering the contributors and also making the art. And so in some ways, um, I mean, this is my first book, so I don't have a whole lot to compare it to because the other books that I've been involved in, I've been the illustrator for those projects. So here I worked with a great designer at um, from Workman for my publisher her named Sarah Smith and she and I sort of worked collaborati co excuse me collaboratively to think about the book as a puzzle and each um, each contributor or section of the book could sort of be moved around like puzzle pieces so we knew what the manuscript was going to going to be and then I had um, for all of the art that's in the book I sketched everything first. So we actually pieced together the whole book with the sketches and the manuscript so that when it came time to do all of the final illustrations, I knew exactly where everything was going to go. I knew, you know, I had sort of like the colors mapped out in my head. I had a, a vision for what that would look like. And that was really helpful when it came time to go to that next step because, you know, for example, I knew if this illustration was going to go bleed off the side of the page or span the full two pages. Um, so it was a really great process that way because it felt like the text and the images were getting all equal weight together and really getting woven in as part of all of the story together. Well, one of my favorite uh, pieces of art and stories was uh, for Julia Turston. For all of you who get the book, it's on pages 18 to 19. And I <laughs> would, yeah, that would be great. I would just love to know a little bit about how you came to this, this photo, uh, this, this illustration. Um, I think it tells so much, not only, you know, about the diversity and inclusion of women and the conversation, uh, but, how, you know, does she show you a picture or did she describe it to you and then you created this? I just would love to know the process. Yeah, great question. So um, for this piece and um, throughout the book, it was a real combination of working from source imagery given to me by contributors, then doing my own research. Um, or, you know, for example, someone might have shown me a picture um, of a tablecloth that was important to them. And so I would put that tablecloth in the background of the illustration. So there were multiple ways of working throughout the book. Um, definitely a lot of source imagery and um, photographs. For this example, uh, in, her, in her essay in the book, Julia writes a memorable meal and, it, and she tells the story of when she um, and some friends in the food world came up with sort of the idea that eventually led to Equity at the Table, which is a group that she started. And so this picture was um, taken at that gathering. And so she sent 
it wasn't exactly like the illustration, but it was sort of like a similar picture. And so I worked from that as the as the basis for the illustration. Yeah, I, um, I remember just going through it with my daughters and we're picking out all the different aspects of diversity, not only just in the color of the hands. I mean, you show diversity without showing any faces. You know, it's just the, the hands and also in terms of the food, and I noticed like, oh, I'm like, look, the plate's kind of Asian. It's the willow, right? And then um, we tried to pick out the food. It was just a lovely way of, of delving into the story as well as, you know, being part of it and, um, and you get Thank drawn you. into it. So it was yeah, it was fun working on um, another contributor in the book is Ruth Reichel. And she, um, she described in her writing five of her favorite meals over the last five decades and really didn't send, I mean, she sent me a few kind of blurry source imagery photos, but I got to sort of take what she sent me and then research um, dishware from each time period. And so that was a big part, like you were just talking about the plates or the bowls or whatnot. Um, it was really fun being able to sort of meet the contributors photos halfway with my own research and imagination, I guess. And how many of the um, inner the the women in this book did you actually meet in person? Well, I got to meet a few in person in the Bay Area, um, a handful. Uh, uh, most of my interviews were over the phone or via email. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the bulk of them were over the phone. I did get to meet Joyce Goldstein in person. That was really fun. She she invited me to her home, so I got to tour her home library. And she has this amazing um, jam and preserves cellar where she stocks, you know, hundreds of different kinds of jams that she's made. Um, so there were a few people that I got to meet, and that was really special. Um, but then, of course, for the second half of making the book, we were in lockdown. Um, and so actually all through making the final watercolor paintings, the majority of those were made during the pandemic. Oh, wow. wow. That's, uh, that would be difficult and very challenging. <laughs> um, I, I'm assuming, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming you met Knight in person? I didn't even get to meet Knight in person. No. No, oh. and we were like miles away, like less than five miles away from each other, <laughs> but I never got to meet her in person. Oh wow! So um, you, the the illustration of the Kriong, I, I'm probably butchering that word. I'm so sorry. Um, it was from just photos and from descriptions from Knight. Yes. Yeah. Well, while we're on the subject of Kriong, Knight, will you be giving us a demo of of this dish or this condiment? Oh yes. Or will you just oh? Why don't we get going on that? We make and I'll Knight. show. This is. This is the illustration from oh, this oh, way. Oh. This is Knight's um, recipe on the book. And there are all the ingredients that she's going to show us. Yeah. And it's amazing how, you know, after <laughs> Lindsay. Oh, <she> wow. <laughs> <laughs> including the mortar and pesto. It's literally. Yeah, look. It's about the same. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. It's such a beautiful book. I'm just so honored to be part of it. But um, yeah, so I'll show you how to make um, kriung. Um, like I said before, kriung is you know the base of most Cambodian cooking. It's the heart of many recipes. And um, the recipe starts with, um, I don't know if you can see me, but we have lemongrass. We're good, you know? yes. Mm -hmm. Before you um, prep the lemongrass, you need to peel off the um, the layers, the outer layer, because it's very tough. Um, so make sure you remove that. Um, okay, and once you remove it, you want to have a sharp, very sharp knife to cut the lemongrass because it is very tough and fibrous. And then um, I've already cut some lemongrass here just for the demo sake. But as you can see, it's very. Oh. Can you, you move? Yep. Thank you. Okay. So um, you have to cut that very thin because of the fibers? Yes, you have to cut it very thin because what you'll do is you're going to put it in the mortar and then the smaller it is, the easier it is for you to um, grind it into a paste. 
If it's too thick, you'll be pounding for hours and your arms will literally fall off unless you want to really <laughs> <laughs> So um, lemongrass goes in first because it's the toughest ingredient, but let me go down the list of all the other ingredients as well. Um, the next thing you want to add into the mortar is galanga. Here you can see um, it looks like a piece of ginger. I'm sorry, my phone. Um, it's very tough. It has a very pungent, peppery smell, but this is also a key ingredient in making kriyam. In Khmer cooking, we necessarily don't use the ingredients by itself. It's mainly to make the kriyam. What you want to do is peel off the skin, again, cut it into small pieces, just like this. Put that in the water. And then the next ingredient you have is um, turmeric. This will stain your hand, so be careful when you're prepping it. You either want to wear gloves or just have fun with it. Kill off the skin. Um, it's really, it has a mild ginger flavor to it. And you want to kill off the skin, cut it into like a small nub like this, put it in the water. And then once I have those three ingredients in there, I'll start pounding it mm -hmm, until it forms a nice paste. Uh -huh. So, Knight, um, for those who can't get fresh turmeric, I, I, I know that I've only recently seen, well, in the last mm -hmm. 10 years or something, seen it in the grocery stores. Um, can a person use ground turmeric if they're in a pinch? Oh, yes. You can definitely use ground turmeric. There's um, a lot of um, single origin, organic, good quality turmeric out there nowadays. But when you do use powdered turmeric, make sure you only use, um, like, less like a teaspoon because it's very potent and strong mm -hmm. yeah so i learned how to make kriyong when i was you know growing in the kitchen with my mom and i didn't know how integral or essential this um the kriyong was when i was growing up until much later so i have that in there and then as you can see it's like in this nice you know pace and the color also tells me that I'm on the right track because if it's too pale, then I would add a little bit more turmeric because usually um, you want it to be kind of like this bright orange piece. So we should follow the color guide that's in Lindsay's illustration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it was interesting, Knight, when you were telling me more about um, about this recipe and how integral it is in Cambodian cuisine, you said something that I thought was so interesting, which is that, um, and you just, you hinted at this just a moment ago, but you said, you know, you can't really take one ingredient a, out apart, a that it's it's really about the combination of all of the ingredients in Kruang that make it so special and make it sort of the base of all other Cambodian cooking. Yes, that is, that's right. Like, you know, like we don't use lemongrass by itself. We do in certain soups and stews, but you know, when you have all these five ingredients together, it's just, it's, that's where the magic happens really. It's like the central part in Cambodian cooking. And it's just so versatile. Like kriyong, you can make it into soups, stews, um, marinade. Um, you can email me for recipes. <laughs> <laughs> now I know, follow you on your social media and I'll get an answer. <laughs> Uh, and the smell is incredible. I wish you could smell this. It's just the lemongrass and the turmeric and the galanga together. It's just, I don't know, it's very, um, it's aromatic and therapeutic at the same time, which is weird because it just triggers a lot of good memories with me and my mom learning how to cook together. Um, so you have all those three ingredients together. And then there's that paste again. After I have that paste, I'll add um, uh, recrut lime leaves. Um, you want to remove the stem. I do that by just kind of ripping it off the stem. Um, the stem is just too tough for you to you know, pound it in the mortar. And I'll roll it up into like a small piece like this. And then I'll come over here to my cutting board. Let me know if you can see it. And then I just want to cut it into like a small ribbon, just like this. Okay, once I have that, Come back to my mortar, put it in the mortar, okay. and then the final two ingredients will be shallot and garlic. Okay. I can smell the, it all already. All the proportions for like you're making a pretty small batch right now, I think. 
I but am. The, the proportions for how all of the ingredients fit together are all in your recipe. So you could pare down the recipe to make it smaller like you're doing, but in the book, I think you call for three pounds of lemongrass in the book. So <laughs> it would be a big, a big batch. <laughs> so can one freeze? Uh -huh. so in case you use three pounds of lemongrass. <laughs> Um, you can, I mean, when you're making this, I like to do a huge batch just because it takes a lot of time and you just want to get it done in one go, but it freezes really well. Uh, I would freeze it and put it in like Ziploc, individual Ziploc bags. And then, you know, if I know I'm ready to make like a marinade or a stew, I'll just take like a packet out and it's ready to go, but it freezes really well. But, um, yeah, three pounds of lemongrass, that is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it was the restaurant recipe. <laughs> Yeah, you'd be set up for a long yeah. time. <laughs> but if you're going to be doing this, you may, and for some people, getting all the ingredients may not be that easy. So mm -hmm. if you're going to go through this process, make a lot. And, and yeah. I love the idea of freezing it and having it ready whenever you want Yeah, to add some spice. Yeah, you can have your friends over, help them take turns pounding the lemongrass because it is a little more. <laughs> And you have to use the mortar pestle. You can't really use a food processor, right? Is there a, something electric, <laughs> an appliance that we can rely on? Well, good question. I was going to say, if you don't have a mortar and pesto and it's just too much work, the thought of just pounding three pounds of lemongrass is too much, you can definitely use a food processor. I've used the KitchenAid, but the only thing is um, you have to add a little bit of water to make sure it blends well. Because if not, it's going to be like this coarse like paste. Um, it dilutes the flavor just a little bit when you use the food processor, but it does it gets the job done. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So we have the on um, the lime leaves in here, the recoat lime leaves, and then you add the um, garlic, and then the shallots. Okay. Whoops. Okay. So now, you traveled to Cambodia and um, to learn about cooking, right? So it started with your mother. Did you learn a lot more or did you learn more regional food when you were in Cambodia? What, what were you doing? Um, yeah, so the first trip I went back to Cambodia was to really connect with my family and to learn more about my family's history. Just because growing up, my parents didn't really talk about the past. Um, it was just such a traumatic experience for them to, you know, survive the genocide. And then I think it was my third trip back was when I really wanted to immerse myself in the cuisine. Um, and then I learned, you know, about the different, you know, type of cuisine in the different regions in Cambodia. Like, for example, in Batsambang, which is the countryside, to eat a lot of the um, um, Prahok, the fermented fish paste, just by itself, because it's the only source of protein. And then when you travel to the coast in Kampot, you realize that there's like this abundance of seafood, and they eat a lot of um, just the specialized fish sauce. And then um, when you go to Phnom Penh, that's when you see the, the capital, um, inspired by French techniques, with just pate and butter, and then there's like this local lot dish and french fries and Cambodian and it's one dish I had which is really um, interesting but yes I learned how to cook with my grandma and my aunt back in Cambodia and brought it back home uh -huh. and it's very similar it's like wow this is amazing how I grew up cooking this with my mom and then the technique and the ingredients that they use back in Cambodia is also the same so um one of the things I thought it was so interesting learning about um your cooking like your experience learning how to cook night was how you taught you talked to me a lot about how um your the recipes that you know so well now were never written down and so a lot of the the food history that you know from your mom and your grandmother um is has come through conversation not necessarily like a recipe card which i think is a you know says a lot about not only the food but how food is part of your relationship with your mom um and I don't know, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Oh, yeah. Like growing up, me and my mom would spend a lot of time in the kitchen, but we barely talked at all. But my relationship with my mom became, you know, we, you know, we had a relationship through food, through conversations when I would call her over the phone 
to ask her about certain recipes, you know, recipes that doesn't exist, but more of, well, here's a list of things you'll need, and this is the proportion that you'll need. And through that, we connected and bonded with the recipes. And um, in a way, that was, you know, um, my desire was to learn more about my mom. And I thought, what better way through food? And um, you know, through our conversations, I learned that my mom didn't know how to cook. You know, she came from an upper class in Cambodia and she learned how to cook by just observing the maids. And um, and so, I think mean, Lindsay brought this up too, where, you know, like my mom learned how to cook just through observation and through her instinct. And now I'm learning how to cook through my, through my mom memories. You know, it's this really, um, like, to know that um, our recipes weren't written down, but it was more of an instinct that's in us um, to recreate the recipes that I have now. It's also a, a way of sharing one's love, right? Your history, your love to what you um, found dear in terms of food or sharing the food with your family members um, and then passing it down with each generation. Um, I One of the questions that you asked, Lindsay, uh, and I'd like to pose to the two of you was, um, I have a lot of sticky notes that I'm trying to find my <laughs> question, but um, I think it was like, what's your favorite part of the cooking process? And often it was um, the sharing of the food afterwards. Is that the same for both of you or is there a different part of the process that you enjoy? Me, you, go you, go, you can go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my favorite part about cooking is sharing my story, telling my story um, through food, connecting with people through food, um, and also the bond that I have with my mom right now. It's um, kind of, you know, we didn't have a relationship but through food and, you know, um, wanting to learn about her and her opening up through food has been a very special bond. And um, I think that was my favorite part, really. I would say, I mean, actually similarly tonight, I feel like um, the process is my favorite part, like being in the process, in the creative process. And that was a big part of this whole subject that I was interested in from the start that um, really connects to my creative practice too, which is actually being in it, making something with my own hands. Um, and often that does bring me into doing that with other people, like my own daughters. And there's so much um, crossover there in terms of how we communicate and what we learn together um, that I feel like that I'm continually brought back to that place whenever I you know, need inspiration or um, want to figure out what it is that's compelling me to be in the kitchen. I always thought that my favorite part was the eating part, but <laughs> that's really good too. <laughs> but I, I have to admit that um, having children, I have two daughters of my own and that sharing the process and the stories behind the food, um, it, it, it it goes beyond just the food and um, it ties one's history and culture together. And there was a, I, I can't remember the, uh, the contributor, but that she talked about cultural belonging with food. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just love to know more about how that resonated with you, Lindsay, and, and with you as well, Knight. Go ahead, Knight, if you wanna take that first. How it resonated with um... cultural belonging. I mean, you grew up in Stockton. I don't know how old you were when you came to the states, but uh, uh, being a, an American-born Chinese, I know that uh, I didn't know if I was Chinese or if I was American. And we ate Chinese every night, but I, I wanted to eat mac and cheese like my friends from the Blue Box. But yeah. my mother, <laughs> my mother didn't do that, right? So which, <laughs> I was very conflicted and. Um, uh, well, it was really interesting for me because growing up, we I felt like I was Cambodian. Like we grew up, you know, I ate rice with my hands. The food I ate was always Cambodian. Like we spoke Khmer at home. Um, 
English is my second language. When I started school, you know, I um, had a hard time adjusting because I thought people in school were different than me. Like I'm Cambodian, like who are, like what are they? Like I, I, was, I was the normal one. Like when I brought rice and fish to school, I looked at my lunch and I said, what are they eating? That's so weird. Like, what is that? Like a sandwich? That's really weird. <laughs> so I always identify myself as Cambodian growing up because, you know, my parents didn't speak English. It was everything we did was, you know, we were Cambodians. And so, but then starting, you know, in elementary school, I realized, wow, I think I am the odd one. Like everyone is eating a sandwich and there people are eating. Like I'm the only one that has rice in my lunchbox. So I was very conflicted, but then for the most part, I think I've always identified myself as being Cambodian. But then the interesting part was when I went to Cambodia for the first time, they looked at me as American, even though I identify myself as Cambodian. So, but now, you know, years, years, years later, I can say I'm Cambodian American. <laughs> How about for you, Lindsay, the, the culture? Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. My uh, for, on a personal level, I have started recently through this process investigating my own family's um, cultural background in a in a deeper way, and it's something that I haven't learned specifically that way about my family's history in terms of like our food traditions. Um, my own childhood food traditions were sort of more. Uh, Involved, it was more about being involved with my mom in the kitchen and helping her do what she was doing. My mom was also is also a um, like very into into healthy eating, and so um, that was a big part of what I learned as a kid about cooking. Um, I would say that uh, I, my curiosity for myself has certainly been peaked in terms of like I want to know more about my, half of my family is German Jewish and half of my family is. Finish, and I want to know more about all of that in a much different way than I did even a couple of years ago. Um, so that's something that's really exciting for me. But I do think you make a great point that through um, through the book, there are there is this impulse that is that everyone relates to, and that is that this is a way not only of um, food food and cooking are a way of not only of getting to know ourselves and our own histories and cultures better and in a deeper and more intimate way, but also in connecting with other people and understanding where they come from and what's important to them and why. And I think, um, you know, in a moment like we have been in for the last four years politically and then through the last year, especially with racial uprisings and um, the pandemic and all of these things that we're experiencing um, globally, I think that food is a place cooking is a place where we can sit down and share a meal and there's going to be something that we can talk about and have in common. And I think that even just as a participant in that conversation in this way, like being involved in the research and, and talking with all these women, I felt tremendously hopeful by having those conversations that there's just so much that there's so much that we can do when we sit down together and share a meal. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I I feel like, at least in a, from my perspective, in a relatively dark moment the last few years polit politically, this was really, um, really a bright spot. Yeah, we have a, a, a question in our Dory that says, um, thank you uh, all for being here today. Knight, what advice would you give to people who are trying to bring their culture and food to the world? Um, what advice I would give them? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I was so deeply like passionate about my culture and my history. And that was greater than any fear that I had because I'm not a trained chef. I didn't go to business school, but my love and my passion for introducing Cambodian food and connecting with my family's history was just so like in my bones that I didn't have a choice but to go for it and to pursue it. And um, the back of my mind, I thought, you must be so crazy to do this. But, you know, my passion and my desire to just push my food to the forefront was just 
you know, ingrained in me that I had to do it. So my, I mean, it's easier said than done, but you know, if you have passion and you love, you know, like your idea and what you had to, but you're constantly thinking about it and you can't stop thinking about it, then that is a definitely a sign for you to just pursue it. And if you give up and you fail, keep on going because I have failed so many times, but I just still went for it. Matt, you didn't even know this, but you answered two questions with oh. that one answer <laughs> because somebody actually was asking about your fears of, of opening up a restaurant and how you overcame them. And I, uh, I mean, your passion comes through and so glad that you did because I have eaten um, at your restaurant and really enjoyed your food. It's, it is just amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I don't want this to go, it's a little off, not off topic, but it goes back to what you had just said, Lindsay. And for those of you who get the book, and again, I highly suggest you do because it's an amazing book. Um, the story of Jane, um, when you were talking about bringing people to the, the table was um, just so powerful. And that was Amanda Saab's story of her, um, was it dinner with your Muslim neighbor or something? I can't yeah, remember. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me find the page and I can show everybody. Um, so uh, Amanda Saab is a chef in Detroit, and um, she was at, she was actually a participant in on Master Chef, and um, she was the first woman in hijab to ever participate uh, in the show. So that was a pretty landmark moment, also. Um, she started a group in Detroit uh, called Dinner with Your Muslim Neighbor, and they host dinners literally um, inviting strangers into her home to share in uh, a meal. And so in the book, she talks about uh, one of those meals and a woman that she named Jane in the writing um, who basically just had a revelation, I guess you could say, um, yeah. a moment of sort of just unwinding all of her, her own stereotypes. Um, and so obviously dinner with your Muslim neighbor hasn't been able to have gatherings over the last year, but I know it's something that Amanda is really looking forward to, um, getting back to after the pandemic. Uh, and let me just find her. Yeah, that was definitely one of the stories that brought tears to my eyes because it was just so touching about, um, breaking bread. Yeah, and um, and and sharing one's uh, culture, experiences, and and to bring down a lot of the the um, the walls of perception that we might have because we all eat and we all have taste buds and we can all appreciate delicious food, right? And that that brings us to the table to have conversation. So it was just so glad that you added and it had that two page, you know artwork it was lovely yeah yeah and i think that's you know i think that that those uh that same theme comes up in multiple stories which i think is also really profound and in, in terms of i didn't tell obviously like i didn't i didn't tell any of the contributors to write what they wrote it, it was really a natural organic like back and forth conversation you could write this like how about this and then somebody would come back with an idea a few days later um, or decide that they wanted to share a recipe. And um, I think that, that that is kind of a really interesting thing that that all kind of came about organically and that those themes are there from multiple different kinds of perspectives and, and you can thread them together that way. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a little emotional right now, <laughs> but so, uh, excuse me, but, um, so I'm going to answer, ask one more question that we have on here, and it's back to Knight. I'm going to bring this back to a lighter topic. Um, but Knight, you mentioned how hard it was to access Khmer food. Uh, that leads to many of us to learn from YouTube, right? Um, because that's how we all learn these days. Uh, how do, uh, what are some of your go-to Cambodian YouTube chefs? Um, when I started to learn how to cook I think there was only one YouTube channel and it's mom's Cambodian recipe it's the OG 
Cambodian <laughs> YouTube tutorial, <laughs> mom's Cambodian uh, recipes, I think that's what it's called. But now there's like a handful of um, Cambodian YouTube channels and they're beautifully done, uh, very detailed recipes. Um, but I would definitely um, say mom's Cambodian recipes. And then there's one that I just discovered recently called Kitchen Story. Um, and um, she also learned how to cook you know, with her mom and um, she now lives in Korea. So she's replicating or cooking Cambodian food. Um, you know, she missed home cooked meals. Um, but it's amazing. There's so many YouTube channels now about Cambodian cooking. <laughs> Wonderful. And um, do you have any post COVID Cambodian restaurants to try? I, I'm assuming in the Bay Area, but if you have any other global recommendations, that might be great too. Uh, other Cambodian restaurants to try. Um, there's one that's in my neighborhood. It's called Cambodian Street Food. Um, it's, own, it's run by a small family. Uh, I have not tried it yet, but um, I need to go out there and try it. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, we have nine minutes left, and there are a couple of questions that I, I'd love to, to leave with. One is, um, Lindsay, you wrote this kind of saddling COVID, right? In part before, and then you finished it off. Uh, how do you think this book would have turned out if you actually wrote it during COVID? With like uh, It's such an interesting question. And I've asked myself that many times. Um, you know, I, I was partially working on, I was definitely working on most of the final illustrations after the pandemic started, but then I was also still finalizing the edit, you know, a lot of the editing and um, finishing up the book. And I wrote the introduction during the pandemic, which might seem odd, like as a first time author, this is something I had not thought about until I was doing it. You would think that starting a book, you would write the introduction at the beginning of the process, right? But I wrote, you write, I wrote the introduction looking back on the process and sort of thinking about how to frame the experience of the book. And so that moment happened for me um, around June of 2020. So we were well into the pandemic, um, you know, all kinds of other issues and um, Black Lives Matter was happening and um, is obviously still happening, but um, there were all these things coinciding with me trying to put a framework around how to um, how to introduce this book to a reader. And so that did actually really like those things happening all at the same time did really impact how I thought about that. And uh, I guess it just sort of reinforced a lot of the messages that I knew were there from the beginning. Um, and someone else recently asked me if if the book, um, I can't remember exactly how the question went, but it was something like, uh, how do you think the meaning of the book has changed since before pandemic and to after? And I, and I say the same thing, which is, I think the messages of the book have been strengthened by what we've all been through together in the last year. And I think that also sort of underscores the power of um, the work that women are doing in this in this sphere, whether it's at home or professionally or both. And um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of been amazing. Like nobody would have predicted in 2018 when I started the project that this is where we'd be now. But um, I certainly have grown in my understanding um, of the impact of these stories since the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. Uh and lastly, oh, I missed one question. Okay, I'm gonna ask this question for the, the, the person, the viewer. Um, Knight, why do you use shallots instead of onions? Or can you use both? I recommend using shallots because it's not as, I guess, harsh is the word. Shallot has a much sweeter taste. And it also, especially when you're using a mortar and pesto or a food processor, it has a lot more juice and liquid. Mm -hmm. That's why. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just didn't want to skip that question. I'd be a bad moderator had I. And and then uh, my 
one of the questions that you asked in the book um, was how can women help each other grow and succeed in the food industry? Uh, one of my questions for you to throw it back is, how can we as a society and a community help women in, in the food industry? Well, how long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think that there are a lot of answers to that question. I think the few things that come to mind immediately are investing in women, supporting women, listening to women, um, having like sharing women's stories in as many places as you can. Um, I think that historically women in the food industry have not received the same media coverage, have not received the same capital investing in their businesses, um, you know, haven't been given leadership opportunities. It, it could, it goes on and on. And I think the more that we do all of those things as a society, the, the more it will replicate. And, um, and women in Why We Cook, the women that I've talked to here are doing that and are really at the forefront of making so many of those changes. Um, so that's kind of a, a, there's so many, there's so much more we could talk about about that. And I'm sure Knight would say, I feel like there's just like, that's such a huge conversation. Um, I don't know if you wanna add anything to what I just said. Yeah, I agree with Lindsay, you know, it's like um, the restaurant industry is just changing so much. You know, I started cooking professionally for three years. Like the way that I was viewed in the beginning was, well, you're not the chef, you're not the owner, let me speak to the chef. And I would just, I was just so shocked and surprised, like, why, like, how could they even make that call when I, like, I'm like, oh, you're standing, you're talking to the chef, you're talking to the owner, no. They would laugh and sh you know pushing it like not pushing aside but just like look for the chef and they're looking for a guy that's running the kitchen and like that was my experience when i first started out but you know in three years i can see like the the understanding and the perspective of women chef you know that that we have a role in the kitchen and it's as important as the, a male chef um but you know the conversation still needs to go on um just because you know, there's still people that, I guess, discriminate or just don't understand our role, um, how important it is um, women in the kitchen. Yeah, uh, I think one of the statistics you had shared in, in your foreword, Lindsay, I mean, you did a lot of research, but more women are graduating from culinary school than men, and yet women do not hold that executive chef position, especially in in um, more corporate arenas. So it yeah. is something to discuss and, and to support. And um, for all of you out there, there's an opportunity to mentor, um, be an ally. So definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh, well, um, I want to thank you both uh, for for joining us today. It's uh, it's been a really inspiring conversation and enlightening. And um, the book, again, Lindsay is not just beautiful, but it just it captures all the emotions one uh, can have from just being really excited and inspired to really just delving down and thinking about where we are as a society supporting women and how women support our society and community. So thank you thank so you. much. Um, thank you for inviting us. This was, this was really, really great. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, yeah. And, and hopefully um, if everybody uh, goes out and gets three pounds of, um, <laughs> of lemongrass, we don't see a run of it. <laughs> like I, I read something about how Sherry gets uh, in Atlanta, runs out when somebody puts out a recipe. So um, <laughs> might, let's see what you can do for lemongrass in the Bay Area. That's and right. <laughs> again, thank you for joining um, Toxic Google. We have Lindsay uh, Gardner and Knight Yun um, joining us from Oakland, California. So. Thank you so much. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs>